what is really contributing to the fact mm -hmm. that, you know, we do end up subbing potentially a lot of running with rucking. But let me start by saying that we never really define running, right? Mm. I'm, I'm walk, moving faster than walking. Okay. Then you're running. Great. I mean, apply that to anything swimming. So if I'm flailing around, but moving my body, am I swimming? You know, no, that's not really swimming. That doesn't looks like right. swimming. So right. one of the things that, you know, I think because we have had the chance to work with so many elite running programs, especially Olympic sprinter level problem, uh, you know, groups is that these movements are all hyper technical to have the best expression of a person's body most closely working with what we understand to be the highest expression of the movement, right? So if you are working with elite gymnasts, they look all sort of move the same and all our runners all sort of move the same. And then all of a sudden you come into the, the population like us, and you're like, yeah, I'm gonna get fit. I'm gonna pick, pick up a sport to get fit. And no technique, no instruction, no warm up, no cool down, no support, no building, no range of motion. And all of a sudden what you see is that the body can manage these shapes and positions without training and without, you know, necessary sort of best practice or good practice around supporting that. And you can do that for a long time until, until you can't, maybe you can't. And I think that really is the thing. The problem also, or one of the reasons we're such fans of rucking or carrying a weighted backpack is that it get, what we tell people oftentimes is, you know, you need to go run to get fit. And we're like, mm -hmm. hang on, why don't you just walk around your neighborhood and then let's get a little load on you before we talk about introducing this very complex running skill. There's a woman who runs in our neighborhood who makes me queasy every time I see it. Okay, okay, I have to interrupt. Go ahead. I have to tell a story. So I'm like an armchair physical therapist, thanks to being married to right, Kelly for right. 20 years. Yeah, and you have a little bit of One of, of the <laughs> worst parts of that is that I know enough about running mechanics to find watching, and this isn't just me, this is like our entire Ready State staff too, watching recreational neighborhood runners like is one of the worst experiences for me. Like I see them and I immediately am analyzing every part of their mechanics. You know, we talk about it. We, we actually saw a guy from like 200 meters away in the car the other day. And I was like, Oh, Kelly, look at that guy. He actually looks like he's running pretty well. And then we, he got closer and closer and we're like, Oh, Oh God, look at his knee. It's totally valgus and coming in. And that guy's just two, two more steps away from an ACL tear. And, and so, I mean, Kelly really has, he's ruined us in terms of right. like seeing runners around the world. But I mean, I, I would just like to emphasize what he says. I think there's a couple other things going on. And I think this will also parlay back to probably something you see in your work, EC, yeah. which is, you know, running is so easy and accessible. So a lot of people do it. Um, I think the vast majority of people think because they can do it off the couch, that it isn't a tech, very technical thing and don't care at all about their technique. In fact, they just follow this pattern where they start in like a normal shoe and then they start to get aches and pains. And then they are in a cushier and cushier, cushier cloud shoe until one day when they're 43, they're like, I'm switching to biking, right? Like this is, right. we've seen this a thousand times in people. I think the other underlying thing is this sort of leftover, like cycle logical hellhole that we were put in with eighties and nineties fitness advice. And I think it also relates <laughs> to nutrition, but especially for women, um, mm. you know, as a child of the eighties and nineties and as a woman of the eighties and nineties, like we were all told like the ideal body size is to be stick thin and no matter what you should 100% restrict whatever you're eating and barely eat. Right. And the way to ha have the body you want is to run. Those were like, yeah. the, like literally if we could boil down what you learned as a woman in, in terms of taking care of your health and body and drink tab. In, in the eighties and nineties, like it was like calorie restrict, like it's your job in life and run like literally yep. that that's all. If you could boil down the eighties and nineties for women, like those were the two pieces of advice we were given. And mm -hmm. man, that's deep. Like I still, still have that as deeply in, you know, and I don't even run at all, but like it's deep. And so I think when I see, you know, especially like I see so many women in my neighborhood in their thirties and forties and man, they're just running and their mechanics are terrible. And, you know, but I think it's just part of this like deep conditioning we got that it's like, if you want to be healthy and have the body composition you want, you need to calorie restrict and run. And I think mm -hmm. that's one of the things we, as in like the collective you and we are, are facing as we're, especially you know, talking to people in their 30s, 40s, 50s who come from that era. The other thing we could ask is say, well, running requires this amount of range of motion. 
do you have the range of motion to go do this sport? Like, if you can't put your arms over your head, I'm like, how's swimming going to go for you? People are like, it's really hard. I'm like, okay, well, running could be the same thing. You don't have any hip extension. Can I see you stand on one leg? Oh, you can't. That's really what running is, going from one leg to one leg. Hey, how about hopping on one leg? Oh, you can't do that. Oh, well, that's going to be trickier because running is hopping from one leg to one leg. So if we even took a, a step back and said, well, let's just see if we can improve the components, then we can actually say, what do you mean you can't run? Like human beings at no age should we have to miss range of motion. There's no, what we, all, I mean, running, look, your grandma doesn't need to be able to run a marathon, but a quick jog across the street, there's no reason why that can't be part of the modern language of what it is we're supposed to be able to do. So imagine these elemental skills. No, 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 I don't get up and down off the ground anymore. Well, that's going to be a problem for you. I guarantee you. So again, we can start to say, what is it we should be able to do? Let's use that model the way we do with retirement and start to work backwards. So if you want to retire or set business goals, you set a goal and you work backwards. And if the goal is for me to keep running because that is my joy and my jam, well then let's just work backwards and start asking the questions about that practice. And then we can really start to realize, well, if you're not sleeping a lot, that's going to be really hard on your tissues. If you don't decongest after that 5k run, that's going to be hard on your tissues. If you don't eat micronutrients because you're eating a a 900 calorie cup of coffee with fat in it, that's going to be harder on your tissues. So, you know, I think the problem is we're so durable innately that we put all of these stressors on ourselves and, and without understanding fundamentally good practice. And, And here's an analogy for people. Katie Bowman used this analogy in her book and it's, it's, I call it Bowman's orca. Who's Katie Bowman? Katie Bowman is a sort of nutritionist. Uh, uh, she's a, sociologist, biomechanist, talking, I think it was move, move Your DNA. And one of the things that she talks about is if you put an orca in captivity, eventually that orca fin starts to fold over at the top. Mm-hmm. And the idea here is, well, why does that happen? Is the orca sad? No, it's not. You know, and they call it, they actually have a syndrome. It's called folded fin syndrome. Floppy syndrome mm-hmm. is too, too mean. So, but what ends up happening is because you put that orca in an environment where it can't load the collagen. It can't swim and fight and play and hunt. The collagen becomes weaker. Then you change the behavior of the orca. Now it's spending so much more time at the surface because it's in a water cage that that fin is subjected to greater gravitational loads because it's always at the surface. So you have this kind of two-part thing. Plus, I'm sure orcas aren't eating what they normally eat when they're in captivity. So you have, we've changed the environment, you've changed the loading, you've changed the nutrition, and what we see is degradation of the tissues. Can you imagine orcas not having an orca fin in the captivity, right. in, the, in the wild? That is what's happening to human beings. We just can't yeah. see it necessarily right away. 